meeting of the Eugene City Council and the Lane County Board of Commissioners. And uh, I, I call this meeting of the City Council to order and turn to my colleague, Commissioner Buck. Thank you, Mayor. And I too am happy to see everybody for our uh, July 28, 2020 joint meeting. And we'll open our meeting up now as well. Thank you all for joining us in this uh, remote meeting format we're using in response to Governor Brown's Stay Home, Save Lives order. This format enables, enables the City Council and the, and the County Board of Commissioners to meet and take care of business while keeping its members, staff, and the public safe. For work sessions like this one where there is no opportunity for public comment, those wishing to access the meeting can do so by watching the live stream available on our website the broadcast on Comcast Channel 21, or by calling in to one of the phone numbers listed for this meeting on the public webcast and meeting materials webpage on the city website. And as always, other avenues of communication with me, city councilors, commissioners, uh, and are available, and uh, councilors and commissioners are available, including uh, through email and voicemail. And thank you all again for joining us. So, um, I just, um, I'm going to just make a few introductory comments. It's uh, been um, quite some time since these two bodies have been able to come together and um, a lot has changed since we last had a chance to talk together about the TAC report and our homeless strategies. And I'm very much looking forward to this meeting and appreciate this opportunity for us all to talk together. I, our goal is to find some alignment here, make sure we're all on the same page uh, about how we're going about this and what the challenge is before us. And, and there are some things that have changed dramatically in the last couple of months so that I look forward to hearing the conversation and will uh, just say that I am very hopeful that as the city council, as you talk about this, that, uh, that your comments are fairly focused and clear in terms of uh, weighing in on the new priorities as established, the new data that's made available, because these are changing circumstances. And, and I'm hoping at the end of this that there's a lot of uh, clarity about the priorities as, as described here, how, how those resonate with you, and, um, and your reflections on the, on the work ahead, which staff will work on while we're on break. So, that is my um, appeal to you that we, we hope to end this with a lot of clarity and my appreciation for everyone coming together. And with that, I, I guess I am turning this over to the manager. Who takes it next? Sure, I think um, Steve and I were gonna play rock, paper, scissors about that. So okay. if, this is fine, this is great. I know that Steve and I have been working uh, really closely since I came into this role in October. So I'm one of the things that have changed and I don't wanna spend too many comments, but I will say that um, even just yesterday, a community member in a very, very serious way said, Sarah, what is the biggest, like, what is your biggest concern? What keeps you up at night? And I said, our unsheltered community um, because it just impacts so many people, not just the people that are unsheltered, but everybody that lives here. It, it seems to be top of mind, um, especially with the pandemic and economic crisis ahead of us. So it's really a relief to be here and to be here with all of you. I think this is my first time in this in this role with all of you and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Steve, you wanna say a couple of things? Uh, thank you, Sarah and Mayor and Chair. And I just wanted to offer that uh, Mayor, as you indicated, it's been I think over a year since the city council and the board of commissioners have met in a joint session to discuss this topic. Um, we had lofty goals and visions uh, in May of 2019 when uh, both of our governing bodies represented here tonight uh, approved and, and endorsed moving forward with the strategies and goals identified uh, in our housing and shelter plan. Um, I would say that we feel like we've accomplished uh, a great deal as part of that plan in this time. Um, one of the things that I have, and you'll hear this from Sarai and Sarai Johnson, I think represents our commitment to a true partnership between Lane County and the city of Eugene. 
um, to solve this homelessness crisis that we have uh, in our community. And I've been really proud at how our teams between the city and county have worked together in the course of the last year. Um, I think that's one of the great successes that, uh, that we've been able to achieve. Um, we've also seen great challenges uh, in the course of the past year. And of course, COVID-19 has exacerbated uh, many of the challenges with our unhoused community. Um, and, uh, and of course, we're concerned. Sarah talked about what keeps her up at night. And uh, of course, what keeps many of us up at night is uh, the impacts of uh, the financial impacts and economic and social impacts of this global pandemic on those who may be housed currently, uh, but at risk of becoming unhoused. So um, some successes, some, some great progress uh, that we are making and a lot of challenges and important work that is ahead of us. I, for one, feel really confident in our ability to meet those challenges because of the commitment that we have uh, from our elected officials, both in the city and the county, uh, as well as the talent that we have assembled in both of our organizations. And uh, so we're pleased to provide this with you tonight. And we're really pleased with the work that Sarai Johnson has done here, started just before uh, this pandemic hit us um, and has really been uh, an incredible asset in bringing together our teams and identifying solutions for housing and homelessness in our community. So with that, I'm not sure, uh, Mayor or Chair, if you have any additional comments, and then we would turn it over to Sarai Johnson. Heather, I turn it over to you. All right. Well, I don't have anything more profound to say other that you haven't already said. I look forward to seeing the presentation and just a reminder again that um, we'll have a discussion after the presentation if we can keep the questions really pointed and um, we can move along with, uh, really well and get some progress done before the meeting's over. And with that, I think I'll um, send it over to Sarai Johnson. Thank you, Chair Buck, and thank you, Mayor and Council and Commissioners. I really appreciate uh, taking the time this evening for this work. Uh, I know that you've been working on it for a really long time, uh, and I'm having a fun realization at this moment that my screen won't share until I restart Zoom. So it turns out that I will be back in two seconds. So just, just sit tight, uh, have fun without me, and my apologies. Now that's the kind of substantive presentation I like. I'm sorry. Right, it was quick. It's what are called your tap on that? dancing. <laughs> yeah, that was actually the most graceful technology fail I've ever seen. anticipation you know while she's um while she's getting herself back online i can just i can i can do the couple of the housekeeping things about the structure of this meeting will be familiar to all of you which is that the commissioner and i will keep our respective cues for our for commissioner and council and um we'll as before um open it up for questions and because of the different numbers on each, uh, one one uh, board member at, followed by two uh, counselors, and then we'll and we'll hold people to two minute time frame. So after the presentation, just be prepared for that. Thank you. Looks like Sarai's back. I am. Thank you so much. Well, here we are, and me again with you. Um, so thank you for your patience on that fun technical glitch. Um, as you know, everything is a bit in upheaval. So I appreciate, again, taking time for this conversation. Um, homelessness systems transformation is work that you all have laid the groundwork for and made great policy decisions about in the past. And I really look forward to the discussion today uh, as we bring forward as much information as we can possibly share with you and um, look forward to your direction moving forward from here as well. Today, what we hope for is uh, to really reaffirm a shared vision that we have for making homelessness rare, brief, and non-recurring in Lane County and the city of Eugene. This is work that, again, you've been laying the groundwork for for some time, and that right now, if we take a look outside and, and see how many people are camping in visible places, and um, as Sarah alluded to a few minutes ago, the high number of unsheltered folks that we have here in our community, this might seem like a far off vision, 
But I believe that we have the right leadership and the right resources in place to be able to make this vision a reality if we make wise decisions with the resources that we do have. Um, so I'm looking forward to this happening in real life um, as we move forward. We're gonna talk a little bit about the current situation. So I will share some numbers with you that are more detailed data points than we've had in the past. Then we'll go into a TAC update, which will include some lessons learned from COVID-19 and the emergency response that we uh, mounted with that between the, between the county and the city. And then we'll talk about updated projections based on our update, updated numbers um, around how many people are and where people are in our community. And then we'll look at uh, visioning around inclusion of multiple populations and also a potential regional reach. And then we'll have discussion time um, where all of you can share your thoughts. First, I'd like to touch base on the point in time count. As you know, the point in time or pit is the main way that we have tracked how many people are unhoused or unsheltered in our community um, over many years. So this is a, a methodology that's used across the country throughout all of HUD's continuum of care uh, organizations. And Lane County, City of Eugene, and City of Springfield are the continuum of care uh, in, in our area. So we've always used the point in time count along with everybody else in the country. What's nice about this is it does give us somewhat of an apples to apples-ish view on how many people are unhoused at any given moment. The challenges with the pit are that it is a one night a year effort. So it takes a lot to get out there to do the count. Um, we continue doing it, it will happen again in, uh, in January, I believe. Um, and then we also um, you know, have to recognize that we can't capture every single person in one night of work. So it's really a lot like taking a 35 millimeter picture uh, camera with you to Yosemite, taking one snapshot, bringing it home and saying, this is what Yosemite is like it's not enough to really give us the active daily data or monthly data that we need in order to make decisions, to mount interventions, to find ways to get as many people housed as we possibly can. Point in time count is, is useful in some ways and again, very limited in others. So what has happened over the last year is uh, as of 2019, the HMIS team has been working on developing a homeless by name list. And this list is one that's dynamic. It's updated every single month. And we can see the number of people who are flowing in and out of the system. And we can also get a duplicated cumulative count of how many people have utilized homelessness system, uh, services across our service providers who are participating in the Homelessness Management Information System, HMIS. So this homeless by name list is something that allows us to keep a real finger on the pulse and to, just to mix metaphors, also be able to see more like a moving picture of um, what is actually happening on the ground among our service providers and how many people and and where they are and what other demographics they have uh, or exhibit uh, are experiencing homelessness in Lane County at an, any given month. The April through June 2020 by name list allows us to see some trends really close up. So in the next slide, I'll show you our annual trends. But what this one illustrates in just a month by month numbers game is that people access services much more, um, I guess I'll say aggressively because I didn't think of a better word fast enough. Uh, they access services a lot more often in the winter time than they do in the summer and the spring and warmer months. So people typically need more access to shelter. Of course, we have winter strategies that we've used in the past like Egan warming centers uh, and other interventions that serve people seasonally or that people typically access more seasonally. As you can see from April to May and then all the way into June, our numbers have dropped significantly as far as how many people are accessing services. What this doesn't mean is that we don't have as many people who are unhoused or unsheltered. It just simply means that they aren't act accessing the services that they typically are accessing again in those colder months. This particular swath of time also very likely does have some COVID impacts attached to it as well, because um, as I'm sure you recall, most of us were not going anywhere uh, from March until June 5th, at least. Uh, so a lot of our homelessness services providers were also relatively low capacity, um, not virtually uh, closed. So that is another reason why these numbers have shifted um, over the last few months. And then this is our 12 month system overview. So as you can see last June, that really short bar over there to the left is one that's a bit of an anomaly, um, but all the rest of the months sort of flow in a bit of a pattern. So as you see, most of the months that are not in the summer, 
um, tend to be hover between 4,000 to 4,500 people who in that month are experiencing homelessness and accessing services. So that's the number of people who are seen across our system. And the, some of the important demographics that we should really call out and look at in our community uh, are our high number of unsheltered people. So in Lane County, 80% of our unhoused folks are considered unsheltered, which means that they sleep in places that are not meant for human habitation. That typically means that they're sleeping outside, they might be sleeping in a car, they might be sleeping in an abandoned building, they might be sleeping really anywhere um, that is not a house or a home or an apartment or a hotel. So um, that is a challenge. One of the other challenges that we have in our system, um, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, is that people who are living in alternative shelter sites like the community supported shelters, um, rest stops, and Nightingale and other places like that in Conestogas or car camping are technically still considered unsheltered for HUD. So when we're reporting to HUD to uh, give them our continuum of care outcomes, uh, our high number of unsheltered people really counts against us. Some things that other communities have been able to do to reduce the number of people um, who are unsheltered, who are counted as unsheltered while still activating these great grassroots efforts is that they've found ways to turn those um, units into habitable structures that HUD will accept as habitable for emergency shelter purposes. So there is some work we could do to bring that number down. That said, we have a, a little over 300 people currently in those alternative shelter sites at this point. So that number of 80% is actually not that significantly impacted by the number of folks who are in alternative shelters, unfortunately. So that number is still very high compared to the national rate of about 35% of people unsheltered, meaning that 65% of people who are considered homeless, literally homeless or chronically homeless are sheltered in emergency shelters or other um, programs. We also have a relatively high rate of chronic homelessness, which is a technical definition. I'll give you the greatest overview I can. It's people who have been um, homeless continuously for 12 months and have a disability or who have been homeless for at least a total of 12 months over the last three years. There are a few little other caveats in there, but that's the basics of who that means um, we're working with. So these are folks who've been um, homeless and typically they are mostly unsheltered. Uh, across the country, about 25% of the population of unhoused folks are considered chronically homeless. And here, again, we have a, a relatively larger percentage of people who are experiencing chronic homelessness. Where people live throughout the county, and I've said this on purpose because I think it's really valuable for us to recognize that people who are living outside are our neighbors and they are living where they live, um, usually because that's where they choose to be. Uh, in, or rather, not that they choose to be unsheltered, but that they want to live in their community. Uh, so in as of the June 2020 homeless by name list, we have about 75% of people who are in Eugene. That number fluctuates year, uh, year round. It's all, every, anywhere between 70 to 75% at any given month. So that, that can shift a little bit. Um, we typically see about 10% in Springfield and about 5% in, in Cottage Grove, 4% in Florence, and 2% in Oak Ridge. What this doesn't reveal is the fact that Eugene, Cottage Grove, Florence, and Oak Ridge all have very similar levels of per capita homelessness, which indicates that it is probably a, a good idea for us to start to reach out and look uh, to our rural communities to see how we can support and help them serve their unsheltered population as well. Um, and the same goes for Springfield. I think it's, it's I, I'll speak a little bit more later to a regional approach, but this is sort of the breakdown of where people tend to be. Some of the things that we learned during the COVID response, uh, I personally think there are three things that um, we learned between the various um, ESF six branches. So that's the emergency support function six, uh, working on vulnerable populations and mass care. We were all very focused between the city of Eugene, city of Springfield and Lane County emergency operations centers on supporting our unhoused population through this, uh, that recovery or rather that emergency response branch. So one of the things that uh, we learned was that we saw a natural experiment happen between the Lane County EOC's launch of the emergency respite shelters, which was a congregate shelter option, which means that people were all in one location in one place sleeping in the same room. Uh, While well, the city of Eugene launched a distribution center to support uh, people getting supplies that they needed so they could shelter in place, even if they were in encampments. And their other strategy was designated temporary shelter sites, which were smaller areas that they set up outside of, or that you set up outside of um, the uh, few of the different uh, rec centers throughout town. So 
those were two different things that had different results and different impacts in neighborhoods. One of the things that I think is really important for us to recognize is that the number of people that we're bringing together who have previously not been associated um, should be thought about and really strategized about. So as we're moving forward into how are we going to find ways to house people as much as possible, I think that's one of the things that we're going to really want to look at is what were the neighborhood impacts be between these two different approaches and how can we um, more thoughtfully deploy these different interventions as we move forward, preferably hand in hand with neighborhood associations and with other neighbor, uh, neighbors who are, are interested in being a part of the solution to this very big challenge that we're facing right now. The other, another thing that uh, I think was really useful was that we did talk between all three of those um, EOCs every day for quite a long time. So we really um, moved to twice a week meetings after about two and a half months or so. Um, but before that, we were talking every day so that we could understand what's happening in Eugene, what's happening in Springfield, what are the ways that we need to collaborate. Um, that was really useful. As a, a learning, I would say that the more integrated that we can be, the better off we will be. Um, I think more more great minds and more uh, coordinated efforts really make for better results. So that's another thing that I think is really valuable as we move forward in our overall homelessness systems transformation and our immediate response to making sure that people have adequate shelter as we're entering into cold weather uh, and the winter season shortly. Uh, and then the third thing that I think is really valuable about um, what we've learned from COVID-19 is how, how can we uh, engage with the community and others who see that this is a challenge to work towards solutions. One of the things that I have absolutely seen come out of this COVID experience and that initial emergency response is a lot of community energy and momentum around moving forward on participating in being a part of the solution to our lack of shelter for people in our system. So that's a very promising thing. Not everyone has all the same ideas about how this should work, but all of those ideas have a space um, for us to listen to and um, have at the table. So that's a really exciting trend. As you can imagine, as we're entering into the um, winter season, we have, oh, this is the wrong slide. Let me back up, pretend that I didn't say that. Hi, some of the immediate priorities that we've been working on as a TAC implementation team is uh, across our, our city of Eugene and, and Lane County staff is identifying the four main things that need to happen in the near term. Um, this is our 90 days priorities. Uh, so that started at the beginning of July and goes through September. Uh, and these are things that we are working diligently to uh, design and deploy in that time frame. One is street outreach. Uh, this also could be attributed to a great lesson that we learned from COVID-19. Uh, and our emergency response city of Eugene did a great job of, of coordinating with uh, Lane County Human Services Division staff um, to create a street out outreach approach to meet people where they are, those who are unsheltered, uh, to make sure that they have supplies, information, and other things that are necessary for them to, to be well and healthy. So street outreach is one of the things that is a top priority in the TAC report, but it's also something that we see as a, a necessity moving forward in the near term. So we're working uh, between the city and the county to design that, uh, and we will be planning to hire some folks to staff outreach teams in the very near future. So that's coming down the pike um, rather quickly. The second is landlord engagement. As you all know very well, we are facing a, a possible rental crisis uh, with people who uh, will be facing the eviction moratorium ending in October and of course the very imminent end of the federal unemployment match which is a very big contributor most folks are saying um, who are landlords to people being able to pay their rents. So we're looking to engage landlords in the near term on uh, all of the things that they might need in order to help people stay in place. As you know, on the other side of things, we do have a, a very robust rental assistance program. I know that city council just allocated more funds toward that effort yesterday. Uh, so we're looking to engage with landlords and work with them as well, not just for the near term, but also long term. What we hope to do is, is lay the groundwork to ask them what they need in order to rent more willingly to people who have permanent supportive housing vouchers, which has been a barrier to placement in the past. If you recall, um, we only have about an 87% uh, utilization rate of our permanent supportive housing vouchers. 
And that could be a lot higher if we had more great partnerships with landlords in our community. So that's a, another big important thing that we have going on. And then the third and fourth thing are generally talked about together. I'm only separating them out right now because of where we are at this moment versus where we thought we would be and where we would like to be in the future. So as you know, a low barrier shelter slash navigation center is one of our top priorities. We've been working toward this uh, low barrier 75 bed shelter for quite some time. I know at the city and the, and the county level um, where we have a lot of progress on that. And yet we also have an opportunity at this moment to test drive some of these uh, pieces and parts of what will make this program really successful by, by separating out the navigation system side of things and that case management support and the help, helping people figure out where they can go and, and where they can be from the designated location. Uh, of the navigation center. That is still our long-term goal. That is absolutely still where we're heading in this moment because we have the uh, COVID-19 pandemic crisis on hand. We also are facing a situation where we need to find as much non-congregate shelter as we possibly can for people to be in. Non-congregate means that they have individual space where they're able to go about their day without interacting with a whole lot of other people. Um, so that could be something like is in this picture right here. Conestoga huts work for that, tents work for that, um, motels work for that. So we'll talk a little bit more, more about that in a second, but this is really a way for us to see what works best. Um, it's great, I think, for us to have a variety of approaches. And we also have a very rich and wonderful tapestry of locally grown interventions that have done an awesome job of meeting the needs of our unhoused and unsheltered community in a lot of really creative and impactful ways. So I'd love for us to be able to build into that capacity uh, from the ground up as we're even as we're approaching this crisis moment and the emergency uh, ahead of us. Some of the ways that we might be able to accomplish non-congregate shelter in the coming months uh, and these immediate low barrier shelter options are meant to be uh, an intervention for 12 to 18 months at least. Uh, some of them may be able to continue beyond that, um, most significantly safe sleeping villages and quick build units. Um, so sleep, safe sleeping villages is sort of just a catch all term for rest stops, microsites, and those types of, uh, and the down, uh, designated temporary shelter sites would have been considered a safe sleeping village as well. What we're suggesting that we do is create these in as many places as we can with the help of neighborhood associations, faith communities, business community, and others, so that we can find spots that people will be able to shelter in a safe location. Um, we also have the opportunity potentially to lease up motels and or hotels um, in the coming few months. That would be a great intervention for people, especially those who have high medical needs or highly medically vulnerable to complications from COVID-19. Um, and that could also be something that could phase into um, what I'm calling quick build units for this. Some uh, in other presentations, I've called it modulars or you know other kinds of, of structures, but ultimately that would be anything from upgrading safe sleeping villages to have hab habitable dwellings so that we could count those toward our continuum of care outcomes, which in turn would bring more money into our system from HUD. Um, and, or we could design um, tiny house villages or um, we could get modulars that we could place now and later stack into multi-story units for permanent supportive housing or other options like that, depending on the resources that are available to us. So it is an opportunity um, to find ways to add inventory to our emergency shelter and housing system longer term, even while we're serving this immediate need as well. And then finally, we have less risky congregate shelter, and that is uh, simply smaller congregate shelters in larger spaces. People need to have at least 144 square feet each to sleep, and then there's also additional expansion needs beyond that for common spaces and eating areas and things like that. Ideally, if we do need to mount this intervention in the coming winter, um, it would be best if we were able to do that in cohorts. And so kind of keeping those groups relatively small and encouraging them to stay there uh, longer term would be ideal. Uh, we would like to avoid a situation where we're bringing a lot of unassociated people together in one place and then dis dispersing them to the streets um, right after. We're gonna talk a little bit about updated projections. Um, this is something that has sort of stemmed from our better information from the homeless by name list that we have. And also um, in light of the fact that COVID-19 has really taken a lot of the capacity, especially for emergency shelter beds out of our system. Uh, and at the same time has made our typical winter strategies untenable. 
we've typically expanded at dusk to dawn and added more beds there, which is not something that is on the table at this moment. Um, and we also have really relied on Egan warming centers, which are volunteer driven in donated space, typically from churches and other public um, places. And then we also have um, the fact that we're bringing people together all in one place again, who weren't together the night before and then dispersing them to the streets, which is really a unpleasant idea in a pandemic to say the least. Uh, so this, this is a really big challenge. Uh, we also noticed that the volunteer base for Egan warming centers tend to be people over 60. So that is putting them in the high risk category. So it's really challenging. We have to find a way to make sure that people stay not only safe from the pandemic, but also safe from freezing weather over the winter. And that means that we need to be creative. So that's part of this is like, what do we need to do right now? And then part of this is what is the big picture look uh, based on these new numbers? As you might recall, um, when the Technical Assistance Collaborative came and did their work with us, uh, they were using our point in time count numbers, as I mentioned, more of a snapshot. And so these numbers are based on the homeless by name list and then updating them um, for what we think we need now. This is a multi-pronged expansion. So it's gonna look a little bit different from how it looked in the TAC report, but it will be integrating many of the same things and adding in a couple of other pieces. So first of all, we have street outreach, which is reaching people when they're unsheltered still. So this is finding folks who are living outside or in other places not meant for human habitation and providing them with relationship, helping them solve their issues, helping them remove barriers that they have to housing and to meeting their goals. So uh, next step up from that is alternative shelters. So these shelter sites that are important because they serve a really big purpose in that they can stand up quickly, operate quickly, and they're relatively affordable to run. Um, they're also really nimble and have a great opportunity for innovation. Then we have emergency shelter, which is basically just shelter that meets um, HUD habitation guidelines. So we have the opportunity also to shift more alternative shelter into more um, habitable emergency shelter per HUD. Uh, and that is one thing that we could also do. Next up, we have transitional housing. In the TAC report, they had some recommendations about that. Uh, we are going to have a few more recommendations around transitional housing, especially it's appropriate for people who have extra barriers to housing. Maybe they have um, multiple kind of co-occurring issues that are happening all at once. They might have high medical needs. They might have substance use issues that might need a little bit more intensive support. So transitional housing is appropriate for our system while we ultimately are looking to get into a housing first model. So rapid rehousing is one of the ways that we can deploy housing first. That's a way to help people who are homeless or chronically homeless access housing in the near term with rental assistance. So it, as, it allows them to basically take vouchers and get into housing as, as quickly as possible. And then we have permanent supportive housing, which uh, as you all realize is affordable housing that also comes with a system of supports behind that. So people who are able to access housing right away without necessarily meeting prerequisites to housing and not necessarily being required to participate in any services unless they want to. Most people do. Uh, so that is a great way that permanent supportive housing works. And then over time, not everyone needs the services that come along with uh, permanent supportive housing, but they might still need the housing subsidy. And that's where these move on um, vouchers come in play, into play. So helping people who are kind of through the woods on the services side of permanent supportive housing, ready to move into something else. And that is another really important strategy for us. This is the original tech recommendation. So this was based on the 2018 point in time count of 1,365 single or partnered adults. They suggested that uh, with transitional housing, which is the furthest over to the left, the teal one, that we increase utilization and turnover. So we could maximize how many of those are being used and then try to move people through them a little bit more quickly to generate flow in that system. Um, they suggested 189 move on vouchers through um, their recommendations. They didn't specifically put this in the table, but that's what it ends up with uh, when you do the math. Uh, same with rapid rehousing. They suggested investing, uh, I believe it's $500,000 in rapid rehousing resources over two years to see how that goes. That amounts to about 250 of um, rapid rehousing individuals or households that would be served. And then they suggested a 75 bed low barrier shelter and 350 units of permanent supportive housing, um, which are numbers that I utter in my sleep at this point. So these are the kind of sacrosanct recommendations that they offered to us. And, and it was based again in data that was available to them at that point in time. Now that we have the homelessness by name list, 
we are able to see that those numbers will probably need to adapt. So as you saw, but I didn't call out on another page because your pictures are covering that side of my screen. We did have 9,679 unduplicated people accessing homelessness services in 2019 based on the, high, uh, on the by name list. And so what that shows us is that we really do have a lot more people flowing in and through our system than we thought. Uh, as you saw earlier, at least 4,000 to 4,500 per month generally, especially during the colder months, um, are using these services and many others, as you can tell, are not always accessing services every single month. So we have a lot of kind of in and out uh, in our system. What we would like to do is make sure that we create adequate housing and shelter for people so that we no longer have 80% of our unhoused population unsheltered. So these uh, recommendations are based on some calculations that were done um, by our HMIS administrator. And uh, she used the inflow and outflow and uh, some other fancy footwork to create these based on the homeless by name list. So we have an additional 110 transitional housing units over five years that are suggested to be added to our system. The move on vouchers bump up just a little bit from 189 to 200. So we'd be making a concerted effort to work with people in permanent supportive housing to help them prepare to move on. Uh, rapid rehousing will stay constant at 250 per year that we would hopefully be helping. And then emergency shelter and alternative shelter, you might notice, are quite different than um, what they were before. And these numbers uh, are really meant to see how much um, system capacity do we need to add for emergency shelter beds or alternative shelters. And again, alternative shelters is really here because it's sometimes the fastest way that we can get people into some kind of shelter. That said, again, if we can come up behind that to make these habitable, great, let's do that because then we'll be able to count them as well and they will no longer count as unsheltered. And then finally, we have PSH, um, where we've only recommended six additional units over tax original recommendation. One thing I think is really valuable to note here is that what this is, is a very small picture of sort of the first rungs of the housing ladder. So if you can imagine that past PSH is the move on vouchers, although I put them at the beginning because they are a lower number, um, but that would help people move into more traditional housing. Um, maybe it could still be subsidized through housing choice vouchers or otherwise, uh, but they might not need that PSH. Not everyone in our system requires supportive housing to get into housing. So a lot of people that are unhoused or unsheltered right now have jobs. They just simply cannot afford a place to live right now. Um, that's a, a real number of people that is rising as well. So this is this reflects not that we don't need more permanent supportive housing. We do need as much as we can get, really. Um, but the other reality is that we need more affordable housing or housing rather that is affordable to people um, with very low or extremely low or no income. So these are all um, kind of the big picture strategies. I'm sure we'll have a lot to talk about um, on this particular slide. This is also an opportunity to step back a little bit and see um, who do we have in our community. The TAC work and the recommendations around our 75 low bed low barrier shelter and the permanent supportive housing numbers are all focused on single or partnered adults. Some of those folks can be segmented out even further to find specialized solutions that they really need. Um, older adults have a lot of needs. People who are medically fragile in particular have a lot of challenges. In this environment, older adults and people who are medically fragile are especially at risk because of the pandemic, um, but they also might require additional supports or help that is not currently available to them in the system. People with mental and behavioral health challenges, uh, people who are justice involved, youth and families who were not necessarily included in the TAC work before, but who are a very significant population who also need support and resources. And then finally, making sure that we're really equitably working with people um, who have been underserved traditionally um, and who tend to be overrepresented in our homeless population, people of color, um, Latinx populations uh, in particular. The two most challenging things that we have at the moment is finding sites for um, the safe sleeping villages and other interventions, as well as building capacity in our system. Our service providers have done an amazing job of rising to the occasion, um, in one case, scaling from just a handful of staff to more than 50 to try to meet the county and the city of Eugene and the city of Springfield's needs um, in the height of our emergency response, which was an amazing way for them to scale up um, really fast. What I think would be really helpful is if we can connect and weave together our service provider community in really strategic and thoughtful ways, investing in them and making sure that they have the 
depth and breadth of capacity that we need in order to run a successful um, homelessness intervention system. So those are two big parts and pieces of uh, what we're looking at for this season and this moment. But it's also something that will have long-term impact on our system as well. Adding more sites and that in turn adding more emergency or alternative shelter beds will be important. And then the capacity to run those sites will also be very critical to the success of all of the recommendations that we're working to implement. This is also a moment that calls for regional collaboration. This isn't something that the, the county can do alone or that the city of Eugene can do alone, or even that we as the county and the city of Eugene together can do all by ourselves. This is a county-wide issue uh, and will continue to be a county-wide issue. If we address it in a lopsided way, then we'll have lopsided results. And so I think what we really have an opportunity to do at this moment is to recognize how much room do we need to have at this table and maybe pull out another leaf or two so that we can pull up a few more chairs around the table to work on this um, in a concerted way. We have countywide priorities that we want to see happen across the system. Um, we have systems transformation that we'd like to see happen across the system. And then each city has its own unique focus and approach and style, which I think is really important to honor. That's one of the things that makes the city of Eugene so special, the city of Springfield special, what makes all of these unique locations attractive to the people who want to live in them. And then also together creating a coordinated approach so that we can try to work on this together and continue moving kind of this boulder forward with more hands on deck um, and more force behind it. This is a high level 12 month operating estimate. So I wanna just be very transparent that we are still working on dialing in numbers and finding out what makes the most sense between the city and the county. So we have some work left to do on that and a great team of people who are ready and willing to do that. What we have at this moment is um, some general solid-ish estimates um, based on some different staffing models. These are spelled out in more detail with the exception of the navigation center, um, 75 bed navigation center in the um, inclement weather strategies report uh, that I shared with the board of county commissioners last Tuesday. Uh, so if you don't have that, I'm happy to make it available to you and you'll, you'll be able to see kind of what these budget assumptions are. So for 12 months, this is the basic estimate of what it would cost to run these things. Notable exception on the quick build, um, those are not including the capital. And the main reason for that is simply because it's all of the different ways that we could approach this cost wildly different amounts of money. So depending on which interventions we're interested in seeing, we could create different pro formas for those. At this moment, I think I'm just leaving it at the operating cost only, and then we can add in the capital later. So this is the basic expense of what it would cost to run these interventions for these numbers of people over the course of 12 months. 1.98 to operate 100 beds in quick build shelters, so running somewhat like permanent supportive housing in some ways. Safe sleeping villages, 6.44 million for a year for 500 beds. Motels at 4.6 million for 12 months for 150 beds, including services. And in fact, all of these include food as well as services and staffing. Um, and then the congregate shelter as well. Um, we have the navigation center here. The estimated operating budget for that, based on the staffing recommendations and the TAC report and some numbers that we've crunched for that, uh, is estimated to be about 1.98 million. Um, that would be for 75 beds. So over the year, that adds up to a little over $70 per bed night, um, which is, I think, useful information. I, I like to compare the per bed night cost personally, uh, because I do feel like it kind of gives us a sense of the value that we're able to get um, with, you know, kind of bang for our buck in these different approaches. So these are some high level estimates. Again, these numbers will be dialed in. We are looking for your direction and thoughts on what you would like to see going forward. And then we're happy to dig into that uh, financial work and come back with more specifics. Ah, oh, and now I turn it back to you, Mayor Venice and Chair Buck. Thank you so very much. Thank you, uh, Sarai, that was a phenomenal presentation. Thank you so much. It was a huge amount of material, reflected an incredible amount of uh, work and research and was very clearly presented. And um, I'm letting counselors know that I'm forming a queue and Commissioner Buck, I don't know if you wanna say anything. Yeah, we'll do the same. So Commissioner, since we're on a new platform on the Zoom platform, we're not as used to it. Uh, so under the participants, you'll see people be able to raise their hand and there will be an icon on your device to raise your hand and the hands will go up like 
Council Prior has put his hands up. And as people raise their hands, it will show them in order and way in uh, in order of them raising their hand. And what we thought we'd do is do two counselors and then a commissioner. So I see a couple of counselors came up uh, first and then Commissioner Bozovich. So we'll go in that order and just raise your hand as you would like uh, to make a comment or ask a question. Thank you. So we'll start out with Councilor Pryor. Thank you. Very um, good presentation, Sarai. I really appreciated uh, how you're trying to uh, um, continuously update the numbers as, as we go along from what the original report was. And uh, obviously we are all struck by the change in the um, emergency shelter requirement um, going from 75 uh, to 800, <laughs> you know, if you count the two together, uh, that's, a, that's a huge shift. And so uh, one of the questions I had, and, and really you can bring me up to speed on how this works into the actual um, counting is uh, the original 75 were low barrier shelter um, of the of the 475 and the 350 are those still all considered low barrier or is it a mix of low barrier and regular shelter well what's how do those 800 beds work out uh, it, I think it will be site dependent. So it will depend on the places that we put these. So if a faith community, for instance, wasn't comfortable with people who were, we were using maybe a harm reduction approach with, then that, I mean, that's a, kind of the easiest example I can think of. That would mean that those shelters might be a little higher barrier, but that I would love for us to create as much low barrier shelter as we possibly can. Okay. Yeah, no. And I, I think that, I think that's good because you want to try to be as flexible as you can be. Um, this is a tall number. And so the other uh, question I had was to what degree would a place like the Eugene Mission, which has 350, 400 beds, it's not low barrier, but it has from the tour I took um, all of the conditions that a public shelter would have. In other words, it has no restrictions beyond what a public shelter would have uh, other than a dry requirement but otherwise it's the same as a public shelter. Would those 350, 400 beds be able to be incorporated into this count? The missions beds, uh, if they're not using them, it would take a lot of work. They have actually instituted a low barrier pilot program recently. And so they're experimenting with that and kind of seeing how that goes. Um, and I, I can't really speak to, I, I'm not sure if you mean um, like using their facility to add some of these beds? Is that what- Counting their facility as, hmm. as are, in other words, are they already counted or would their beds be able to be counted here? They are counted already, yes. They participate in um, HMIS even though they're, they don't receive funds from the county or right. the city. Yeah. Okay, so these are over and above that 400 beds. Yes. Okay, that's, I'm good, I'm glad. I, I, I wanna get a sense of where we are, what capacity we're already at and how much further we need to go. And so what I'm hearing is, if you take into account the existing shelter capacity, including the mission, we still have to come up with 800 more beds. Yes. Oh, sorry. I'm thinking three, not two. <laughs> I, I apologize. I forgot to remind everyone you have two minutes. Uh, Councilor Syrette. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sarai, very much. That was an impressive presentation, uh, and I really appreciate the update to our plans. Um, I just wanted to step back because I think this didn't get mentioned. I think it's important to remind the public that one of our overarching goals here is to reach functional zero in terms of people being without shelter in our community. So that means we will still likely see people becoming homeless at certain times because of their personal circumstances, but we would be poised to help them get back into housing quickly, and we wouldn't be having hundreds of people living on our streets like we do today. So yeah, I think that's important to frame. Um, so based on what you're saying, it seems like we do need to look at identifying a number of different shelter sites. Um, I did have a question. The summary of lessons learned from the San Francisco Navigation Center seem to focus uh, mainly on kind of the negative lessons learned. And I was wondering if there were any positive lessons learned from that, if you're able to speak to that. 
It's a very good question. Um, to be honest, I wasn't in attendance at that conference, um, but I can ask the people who were there to see if they could share some of that. That This is just the information that I received and I think was maybe the main focus of that particular session. Gotcha, thanks. Um, so, and then we do have neighborhood associations in Eugene who are coming forth with this idea of microsites within neighborhoods. And so I'm also really hoping that we can partner with the county in finding some more microsites, because um, I think that's gonna be a heavy lift that we're all gonna need to partner on. And lastly, um, I think the other piece that's not part of this plan, but I think um, I'm hoping the county could look at as a plan uh, as well is drug and alcohol access, counseling access, mental health services access, because many of the folks who are experiencing, you know, being unsheltered are suffering from the, those things and need that help. And we might have a place to put them for a while. They need that services in order to transition into permanent housing. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bozovich. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm a little shocked looking at the, uh, the two graphs between the, uh, the original TAC recommendations and the updated five-year projections, partly in because it seems to be heavily dependent on temporary emergency shelter. And my real concern is, is I don't believe temporary emergency shelter really helps people. I believe you need to have a housing first policy that includes that intensive case management. And many of the strategies that are under emergency shelter and alternative shelter don't include that case management, which means you're not helping people deal with why they're homeless and fixing it. And, that, and therefore you're not changing the curve in the long run. So I, I'm real concerned about this, this new chart that shows us so heavily investing in temporary facilities rather than you know if you look at the previous chart the heavy investment was permanent supportive housing where that case management's there and and you're dealing with those long-term issues whether you're getting folks addiction treatment you're dealing with the mental health or the the traumas and the victimization they've 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 experienced uh, getting them some education, connecting them with, with you know, financial skills and how to be a good tenant and everything else. You know, and particularly, you know, when you look at some of the strategies that are being considered, the only, you know, one of the few that, that the few that qualify as, quote, sheltered under HUD's definition, you know, hotels at 30,000 per bed per year, when, when under our FUSE pilot, we were sheltering people for 17,000 with that intensive case management. <laughs> so something doesn't quite add up here for me. Um, although I do know our few pilots a few years old, so the numbers may need to be inflated. So it might be 20,000 a year, um, but- uh, just, a, uh, just a reminder, we have two minutes. Yeah. But uh, I, just, for each I just wanna express my concern about temporary versus permanent solutions for homelessness. Okay, Councilor Zelenka. Thank you. Um, Soraya, that was awesome presentation and um, we did a good job hiring you. I like your enthusiasm. I think it's contagious, hopefully, throughout the whole community on this topic. Um, this is a lot of work uh, and I like the progression that it's had. And, um, and, and I pretty much like the plan uh, I did have a question about when you have these numbers like 9,679 unduplicated people who accessed homeless services and another 6,023 that have used homeless services, what does that mean? What does accessed and used mean? Um, is it just walking in and finding out information or is it actually getting some services? Maybe you can explain that a little better. Sure, thank you for asking that. That's actually a really important distinction to make. 
So the 9,679 number is based on people who went to a service provider who offered them anything from food to um, vouchers for clothes or a motel or hotel voucher. Um, so lots and lots of different strategies across the system. All of the people who are on that list are confirmed to be literally homeless, experiencing homelessness in some way. Um, this number does not include all the people who don't access services. And it also doesn't include the people who access services from providers who don't participate in the homelessness management information system. So if anything, the number of people who are unhoused and unsheltered is likely a, quite a bit higher than this. Um, but that's that's what it means. So it, it when people just like to get tiny a tiny bit nerdier, uh, when people access a service, it just means that they have a case open for them in the homelessness management information system and then closed out. And that's how we get kind of our monthly inflow and outflow. Um, so I don't know if that clarifies, but but hopefully a little bit better. Yeah, a little bit better. And and the pit, of course, like you said, is a snapshot. So it um, are these number these numbers are based off of the data we get from the service providers and the and the, uh, as opposed to the pit, right? Sorry. Yes. Yes. It is. <laughs> I thought I asked you a stumper question. <laughs> <laughs> I was just on mute. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, that's all the questions I had at this point. Thank you. Councilor Simple. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. It's really great. Uh, my my favorite part is how the, the colored pumps change between the two iterations. Um, I wish they didn't have to, but I it seems much more realistic to me. Um, boy, I really want housing first, and I want enough houses so I can put everybody in one, and I don't, and it's not going to happen fast enough. Um, what are we going to do without Egan? You know, we, we saw the, the COVID camping problems, and uh, microsites are great. How are we going to find them? It's the first problem of every single strategy we've had is where. And the second one is who's going to make it work. And the third one is how are we going to pay for it? So these are a lot of uh, new, new needs, new buildings. And, and yeah, I want it. But how do we go from 75 to you know 800? And you know, I don't know how we're going to pay for it. Um, I'm really, really concerned about this winter with the respiratory illness and uh, people out in the weather sometimes without even a tent. And, and if you have one, it could be moved constantly, um, which comes back to my plea, can we let people sleep? You're not causing problems while they're asleep. And yes, people need services. We need to help them to learn how to live in houses, but we have to keep them alive first. And, and that's critical. And Councillor Syret talking about mental health, boy, that's, if I could do one thing, for this city county would be mental health providers. Um, and youth, the youth are, are not getting enough help. I, I saw that there's one, one new thing, but I haven't investigated it. And all the other marginalized and more fragile populations. I'm concerned about those, thank you. Is there a commissioner that would like to speak? If not, we'll just continue down the list, Mayor, if that's okay with everybody. Now, I see Councilor Surratt wants a second round, unless her hand just didn't go down. Oh, here we go. Let me give Councilor Pryor a first round. And you do want a second one? Okay. So, but let's give Councilor Pryor a first round. This is actually a second round. So oh, it's a second round for you, too. That's right. You both. All right. If we're on a second round already, are there any other Councilors who want a first round? Well, Alan wants a second round also. All right. And let's, Commissioner Farr just put up his hand as well. Okay, let's let Commissioner Farr go then. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Buck, Mayor Venice. Good job uh, running this difficult meeting to run. Uh, just a couple of things to point out. And Sarai, the first thing will be a question to you. Uh, we have multi-jurisdictional bodies that work on homelessness and homelessness issues. Uh, one is the Human Services Commission. One is the Poverty and Homelessness Board. And the uh, another is the uh, Shelter Stakeholder Committee. 
can you comment about the value of those multi-jurisdictional <laughs> bodies where people from each jurisdiction in the or from different jurisdictions in the county have opportunities on a regular basis unlike this once a year meeting have opportunities on a regular basis to meet and discuss uh, the dynamic issues surrounding homelessness Sarai. sure um, thank you, Commissioner Farr. Yes, those all of those bodies do really important work um, all the time. And so it is wonderful to have them on the ground with that. And the newly formed, reformed uh, Shelter Stakeholder Committee, I think, is a great example of inclusion. Um, so it's wonderful to have Mayor Venice on there and also Mayor, Mayor Lundberg from Springfield is uh, a member of that. Uh, and we did just vote to expand the membership of that group. I think that they can be very instrumental in helping us to move these things forward, uh, bringing together people from really all sectors um, and uh, from as many different service provider groups as possible. So it's wonderful to have them at the table and I think will be a really important part for us starting to put the puzzle pieces together. Thank you, Sarai, uh, for that. And uh, in particular, the shelter stakeholder the reform committee you i'd like to uh, thank you for being the principal staff uh, support for that committee and that is a committee that has uh, the mayors of the two large cities of uh, uh, mayor venice and Lund mayor lundberg on there but that committee also has cheryl balthrop from the mission dan bryant has joined us um chris McAllister with lived experience uh, sean murphy jacob fox is on that committee along with another number of other folks from uh, from providers so there's an opportunity for uh, uh for multi-jurisdictions to discuss ongoing and dynamic events as they occur. And thank you for your, your support on that one. The, the main thing I want to point out, and this is something that comes through the work on those committees, is the realization that whatever we do with money, money's only money, you know, let's throw $100 million at it, that's only money. If we don't have a geographic location to place the size, we're going to fail. Recently, we have had evidence of that in Bethel when we rejected uh, 11 homeless boys who were in school. Prior to that, we had that, uh, examples of rejection. So it's all boots on the ground. Everybody has to be working at all times on finding geographically dispersed, dispersed sites that are acceptable to the neighborhoods. Thank you. I may come in for a second round. Okay, I will reopen this for Councilor Syrette and then Councilor Pryor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I realized I had a couple of questions I didn't ask, but to kind of thinking about the remarks from Commissioner Bozovich, you know, I agree that the housing first model is kind of been the ideal, but reading through the packet information, the San Francisco experience showed that at least for, for their system, they moved, you know, 650 people into permanent housing through their navigation center and 95% of them ended back up homelessness in homelessness. So it wasn't clear why that wasn't successful, but it could be that a slower approach providing shelter with case management. So our rest stops have, have you know, essentially case management as part of their model um, can build capacity for people to be successful in permanent supportive housing. Um, and then you had mentioned, Sarai, uh, that you know there might be an opportunity to turn some of our temporary shelters into HUD-approved sites. And I didn't know if you had any thoughts about how we might go about doing that. Sure, yeah, we, um, we do. Other, other communities have done so. Uh, a really significant example of that is an organization called Low Income Housing Institute. Um, they serve the Puget Sound area in Washington. Uh, so they have tiny homes that are considered habitable by HUD standards. Um, there are checklists and um, guidance around that. And the basic minimum requirements is that they get wired for electricity, have heat available, and also have water available. It doesn't necessarily have to be running water, as far as I understand. Like it could be a pump or it could be, you know, some other wash basin or something like that. So there are lots of things that we could just make little tweaks to and probably find a pretty significant return on that. Thank you. And then I wondered if you could, <clears throat> excuse me, provide a little more context for the cost estimates that you provided for the safe sleeping shelters, um, 600, 6 million a year for 500 beds. I mean, that seems huge in my mind, considering how lean our rest stops are in terms of how they operate now. 
Yeah, so the, the numbers uh, there are based on a staffing model that includes identif that includes a lot more services than are currently happening in rest stops. So all of the models that I proposed include not only three meals a day, but also um, supervision on site, um, usually by a person who's, who is identified as a natural leader who lives on the site and is then supervised and mentored by a service provider. It's a great way for us to scale up the system while also providing employment opportunities. It's, it's so genius, I can hardly handle it. So that's how the designated temporary shelter sites ran. Um, and then they, so that's a bit why. Um, they also include these cost projections, uh, up, uh, include some housing navigation support too. So we would have actual housing navigators um, who would work between some number of these sites with a certain caseload of people. And that sort of speaks to um, this just to kind of bridge from this temporary piece into how do we want to deal with this long term? That's that navigation system thing that I mentioned very briefly at the beginning. How do we help people actually continue moving up uh, into more and more suitable housing over time? And that can start at the you know getting someone on a tent platform you know in into a microsite, and that can really stabilize them enough to make the next step. So you haven't offered us necessarily, maybe you don't know yet, what the estimated cost of the navigation services themselves might be, regardless of whether we're providing beds. I have not separated out that cost from the cost of each individualized site, um, but we could easily pull out operational like budget for the whole entire system away from capital. And I mean, we could, we could figure out lots of different ways to show that, but that would be totally feasible if you'd like to see that. Okay, thank you. Okay, I have Councillor Pryor and then Councillor Taylor. Um, thanks. Uh, I, uh, I'm, after getting over my initial shock, I, I think we need to, to step up. We absolutely need to do this. and. Um, as I've said before, I'm a long-term person. So like Commissioner Bozovich, I want to think of structural long-term solutions. I recognize that if there's a hole in a boat, I need to patch that hole so no more water comes in. But at the same time, the boat's now got water and I got to bail it out. And so I recognize there is an acute, immediate issue that has to be dealt with. Patch the hole, but also bail out the boat. That means I have to come up with sufficient resources to cover doing both of those tasks. I think that's what we're confronting now. And based on your initial figures, I think we're looking at the range of around 18 to $20 million if we want to try to do both strategies at the same time. Because I agree, you don't just put people in housing first. Uh, they will fail. You have to provide support services that cost money. If you really want to structurally fix the problem, it will take money. And so for me, uh, one of the conversations is, how and to what degree are we prepared to find up to $20 million a year, not every year forever, but at least for the acute period, $20 million a year to be able to deal with this holistically. Because I remember one of the recommendations of the TAC report was, you don't do part of this, it's a whole enchilada or it ain't gonna work. And so if we want this thing to work, we're gonna have to do the whole thing simultaneously so that all of the different steps can support each other. That's a $20 million price tag. And so I'm not scared of doing the work and we do need to find the locations. I completely agree with that, but we need to do this work simultaneously and in a coordinated way, both the long-term and the acute. And I frankly wanna say, let's figure out how we're gonna come up with that $20 million a year for however long we need to do it. Mayor, uh, may we go to a commissioner? Commissioner Bernie. Thank you. I would like to remind us that because this presentation talks about transformation, please understand the transformation has occurred. It's a transformation that has vastly disintegrated the social safety net. We are seeing but a symptom of it. And um, and what we are trying to do is move things back to what most of us grew up with as a closer to normal. I found, un, perhaps this is unpopular, but I found that a very impressive presentation, a very unimpressive situation, almost a dystopia. 
Um, so I have a couple of questions in that context. Um, Sarai, I've been to one of these. This is your first one of these group seances. And I remember asking the TAC reporters, uh, did you count the homeless statistics provided by every school district in Lane County in your assumptions and recommendations? They said no. Have you factored that into this sort of updated version? Because this is an update of TAC projections, and that was the previous direction indicated by uh, the policy bodies, that is youth are not specifically included in this. That said, they are included in this populations we should probably consider uh, because they are uh, an important segment of our unhoused population. Um, since I'm looking at this damn clock that's ticking really quickly, in your presentation, did you say, if you added up all those things, was it 18 and a half million per year for operations? Operations aren't nerdy, they're operations, how things work. Is that what that number was about, which was about, which was servicing about a thousand beds, is that correct? Those numbers are not exclusively operations. Some of them, like the hotel ones, include the cost of renting the motels. Um, and then other ones mostly include the cost of setup. The only one that doesn't include any operations, or rather doesn't include any capital, sorry about that, is the navigation center number of 1.98 million, which is the estimated amount that it'll cost to provide those services to 75 at low barrier shelter long-term. And then the other one is the quick build um, units. So those don't include capital because of that kind of discrepancy. Thank you. What they'd cost. Thank you. Um, and I, I found in other circumstances of life that data doesn't speak for itself. You interpreted data so we would understand what we were seeing. Is there any mechanism to have sort of not politicized, but have the people you're talking about um, look at the data and respond to it to see if your interpretation that you're presenting is consistent with how they feel about it? Yes, I um, actually talk to people with lived experience, advocates, service providers every day. Um, and so they definitely have seen all of these numbers and these recommendations, this and the inclement weather strategies and um, have informed these uh, recommendations as well. Hey, thanks. For, thank you very much. Thank you all for uh, letting me ask the questions. Okay, Councillor Taylor and then Councillor Zelenka. Thank you. I wonder if you looked at the uh, beacon in Madison, a downtown shelter, which I understand is very successful. And I've, I've, I do think we need an emergency shelter and I think it should be downtown to get the people off the streets, which would help those people and also help the people who don't want them on the streets. Um, and other thing, you did you think about single room occupancy? Yes, as a, a permanent supportive housing strategy, I think that's a really promising model for sure. Really affordable and um, also could solve some of the problems around people not wanting to be alone in their four walls. Well, if you're single room occupancy, you could be alone in your four walls. I'm thinking of a place with the bath down the hall. It could be very inexpensive and most people have the, like the people who were featured, the, or one person who was featured in the newspaper recently, um, have some income. And for a few hundred a month, they could probably rent a room. And it's, and I don't think it needs supervision. I don't understand why you think there has to be supervision wherever they are. People can accidentally, or because of the circumstances of life, they can no longer have a house, but they are perfectly capable of handling their own affairs and and figuring out how to live someplace and and maybe planning to move to a better place and i think i think S S sro and, and shelter combined are two of the most important things we could do and if we could somehow support you said have you thought of how we could pay support or get someone to build a single room occupancy 
there are a lot of really great um, development models, and I've been looking into one in particular um, called uh, Gorilla Developers in Portland, and they uh, recently developed a mixed use, uh, mixed income SRO property, uh, I think could be really informative for us here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Councilor Zelenka. Yeah, a question about the prioritization of, of all this stuff. I don't disagree with it. I think it's it's uh, probably correct. I was just wondering if you could kind of walk us through the 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 rationale and the discussion that you guys had to come up with the prioritization of these things and when they were going to happen. I, the 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 homelessness system transformation team members, which does not have a good acronym. Uh, it seems like you know, really good group of certified smart people. So maybe you could just kind of talk about what, how you guys came up with the prioritization list that you did. Yeah, certainly. So the um, policy team uh, that is Steve Mokrahiski, Sarah Maderi, Karen Gaffney, uh, and Christy and Greg, Christy Hammett and Greg Rickoff, uh, all worked together uh, in May as we were looking at the budget and kind of looking at how do we need to implement this in the coming year uh, and identified what were the emerging needs that we thought could make the biggest impact in the near term um, and that we could do at once because all, you know, all 10 recommendations at once is, is really um, not something that we're, we're going to be yeah. able to move forward. So we looked at um, what were the things that we thought were most needed. And um, it looks to us like street outreach is one of the most critical components uh, of this, but that's partly to make connections with people and bring them in to receiving services and being kind of a part of getting their feet on the ground and in, into housing. Um, yeah, so we, I mean, we really worked through that in quite a few meetings and, and kind of honed that in. Uh, and then once we had determined that for the budget process, of course, we then were looking at, oh, wow, because of COVID-19, it turns out there's all these other impacts. And that's where landlord engagement kind of hit the list as one of the top priorities as well. So it's sort of a, we thought these would make the most impact and also here are some of the immediate things that we have to respond to. Yeah, impact-based. So yeah, that sounds good. I actually wasn't very... Uh, blown away by the budget actually it was less than i thought it was going to be i think um one of maybe our next tasks is to figure out what the funding sources would be whether or not that's a uh, a, a, a levy that we put out to the voters or other uh, other types of mechanisms but i i am encouraged by the <clears throat> by that number actually i think that if uh if we took something to the voters for instance and said 18 million dollars would, would a year as a levy which wouldn't be very much for folks would would uh, have in the county would have a significant significant impact on homelessness in in our community i think i think people of uh, lane county and eugene would step up to that and do it so i'm encouraged Well, I wanted to take a moment just to say a few things as well. I know that we don't have a lot of time left, um, but I just wanted to express uh, my gratitude for the presentation. And I absolutely agree that the by name list is far more accurate than the point in time count. I know for years, people have thought that that was an undercount and this helps us see reality uh, much more clear in our own community. So I think that is a, a big step forward for us so that we know the actual size of the issue we have in front of us. And I also um, appreciate the quick build design. Um, it, it, you know, what I don't want to see is us throwing millions of dollars, both agencies throwing millions of dollars every year into this and it not return some kind of investment capital in the future of drawing down these numbers. And so those, um, those quick builds or other designs that turn into permanent features to address this year after year, I think is a, a really important step for us to make. And lastly, uh, on the financials, I would like to see some more in-depth financials because it really does come down to how much resources we have available compared to what the need is and what that actual cost is. So in the future, 
if we could have a, you know, a list of the items, how much they're all gonna cost and some more detail, and then how much has the county and city or other agencies committed to each of those items? I absolutely think you know, the financials are really what is gonna drive us um, to get some concrete things in the ground and also open our eyes to the need that we have. We do have a couple of other, well, three more commissioners in a queue. We have a couple, uh, a couple more minutes. I'll, I'll see if Mayor, it, if you had anybody that was not on the list as participants that wanted to go in queue. I don't have any. I would like to jump in and ask one quick thing, though. Uh, a quick question about the two. The two challenges are sites and capacity within the providers. And I wonder if you could just uh, speak to how we are assessing the capacity of the providers and how we'll move forward on that. Yes, it's a really good question. Um, as far as assessing at this point, it's been relatively informal. It's been through, you know, asking, hey, do you want to do this or can you take this on? And them saying, uh, no, please stop. Uh, so that's that's kind of the way that it is right now. Um, I'd say that the service providers themselves understand what they need really well. And what I would love for us to be able to do is to listen to that and work with them to help them to build capacity relatively quickly, but with substance. And so, you know, in my work as a, when I was working in nonprofits, I worked um, at, a, you know, community housing development organization at the height of, actually at the dawn and height of the housing crisis in 2008. And that work made us scale very quickly without the appropriate infrastructure. And so I think it's really uh, important for us to help them do this in a way that doesn't put them at risk of kind of collapse. So um, yeah, I think it's really just super paying attention to what they need and making sure that they're adequately funded, that our contracting works for them and pieces like that, um, that would need to be informed by them. Thank you for asking that. Okay, uh, if there aren't any other counselors in the queue, I'll go to Commissioner Bozovich. Thank you. Um, real quick, let me understand how you end up on the homeless by name list. If you access services once for one night, are you on the list? You're on the list for that month, yes. So do we have an idea by percentage how many people were just accessed once for one night versus how many people accessed all 365 days of the year? I can get that information for you for sure. So I can ask for that. I don't have it offhand. Yeah, because one of the things about point in time is, is that's supposed to be an estimate of our, you know, worst case by day. And that's what the mathematical model was built on by the folks that wrote the TAC report. And now we're changing the database to something that one day counts and, and estimating need for shelter from that. And, and I have to say, I'm a little surprised by this whole thing because it took till page 23 of a 27 page report to get to the fact that you wanted to completely change the recommendations from a national consultant on homelessness about how we were going to deal with this issue locally and get to keeping homelessness short and rare and, and you know, all those good things. So I still believe that housing first connected with intensive case management, not just housing first on its own, own but with intensive case management is our long-term best solution and best investment of our resources. And frankly, if I had 18 to $20 million of extra resources to invest, you know, I've got a whole lot of services we cut back in 2011, 12, and 13, as we lost our SRS funds that I would sure like to put back in service. You know, it, you know, so this is in competition with a lot of other things. Um, so I just have to say, I'm a little surprised that the emphasis was on the change in the data and not on continuing the tack, which was the first 22 pages of the report. Okay, I'll go to the next commissioner, Commissioner Farr. Thank you, Chair Buck, and uh, thanks for that point, uh, Commissioner Bozovic. You know, uh, permanent supportive housing is very expensive. We have a 51-unit uh, complex that is 
uh, currently being completed that the county is completing on MLK Boulevard. Won't go into details, but it's very, very expensive to uh, provide that type of housing. That wasn't my point. Um, there are two questions that re really need to be answered. And Joe, Bernie, you brought up that you weren't particularly satisfied with the report. Well, it doesn't capture these two facets. One thing is where are the homeless people coming from? It's very dynamic, um, the, the situation in, in Eugene in particular, if you see the numbers, but in Lane County in general, the numbers are rising. Where are the homeless people coming from? I'll get the answers to that in a second. The second question that we have to be honest about is why is housing so expensive and so unavailable in Lane County and in Eugene? What are the cost factors that drive up the cost of housing to where the median income can just barely afford housing, to where the rental market has, uh, has two bedroom apartments going for $1,200 a month? So the uh, regarding where are the homeless people coming from, um, the numbers are much larger than they've been ever before. And we need to be honest once again about how are people becoming homeless in Lane County. Anecdotally, we hear that people are getting tickets from elsewhere, from Boise, to come to Eugene. Uh, I don't believe that's, uh, that's very broadly true. We also do hear about a lot of people who can no longer afford their housing. We hear about seniors who, on fixed incomes, at, find themselves in a situation where they can't afford their rent anymore. And we find people who, are, who have newly acquired physical disabilities that, cost, that uh, force them out of their housing. We need to answer these questions. We, we will be spending quite a bit of time figuring out where the homeless people are coming from and why is it so expensive to live to find a home in Eugene and Lane County. All right, we have one more commissioner that would like to speak. If it's okay, we'll do that. And then maybe if our um, manager and administrator wanna help wrap it up, if that makes sense to everybody. Commissioner Bernie. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> as we're honing this down better, which we will constantly do, I presume. And as we get answers to some of these questions, um, which I believe you, we shall do, I presume. Um, I, I think at the same time, council person Zelenka, I agree with him. I think if there are ways to generate this amount and have a bias towards action, always, always modifying and adjusting, I honestly, and if it does not continue with existing county dollars, which was the concern, I believe, that Commissioner Bozovich raised, I personally believe that there might be mechanisms that are relatively painless to generate some of those dollars to partner with a national foundation that is looking for community-based solutions to homelessness and shelter. While we complain about the cost of housing here, and it is high and getting exorbitant, it's one of the least costly places on the West Coast, like either the West Coast states, in terms of median prices. I believe that, the, and if we look at this more globally, like, yes, we can, let's tackle the whole damn thing, if possible, and move forward. I think we can talk, we ought to start talking solutions so we see units produced, we see services generated. We see foundations that want to invest their dollars because I really do believe there's a unique play of capacity here. I also privately know two developers that I believe will likely be responsible for creating several hundred units over the next year. So I really would like to encourage us as best we can, as critically as possible, to support moving forward with something uh, and support Sarai in her in her and in her work helping us do our work. Thank you. Very good. So uh, we can have our city manager and administrator wrap us up here for our meeting, Mr. Mokarski. Um well, I, thank you to uh, the Board of Commissioners and Eugene City Council for taking the time here tonight. I think it was a great uh, discussion. Uh, thank you to Sarai Johnson and to our staff, both at the City of Eugene and Lane County for uh, all the work that they put into uh, what we think is, is really a great uh, presentation. I think this was a wonderful discussion and the feedback from all of you. 
Um, I know that there were some comments regarding permanent supportive housing and questions about that and not as much time was spent on that tonight. I wanna reassure both the board and the council that we remain committed uh, to permanent supportive housing as uh, these, the, the stronger solution in ending the cycle of uh, homelessness. And as many folks have indicated, this really is about making investments in all of these systems to create a pathway to end homelessness. There's not a silver bullet. There's not one solution that will fix this challenge. So on permanent supportive housing, you know, we're, we believe we're about half to two thirds of the way there in terms of the commitments that were identified in the original TAC report of 350 units, uh, 51 units at the MLK property that the county owns, an additional 20 units uh, with secured funding on county owned property at the fairgrounds, uh, additional units at the planned 11th and Charlton project, uh, another 40 plus units between various community organizations and sponsors and NEDCO and not NEDCO, uh, Dev Northwest uh, and other organizations. So there's a lot of work going in there, um, a lot of funding that's been put forward, land that's been identified and leveraged, and we need to continue that work. Um, and then I think uh, I will just say that uh, the, the suggestion uh, Chair Buck made regarding identifying and clearly defining the, um, the cost elements of these plans, updating that information and identifying uh, where there are gaps and what organizations and agencies are funding different pieces of this, I think is really gonna aid in our future conversations so that we can get down to, okay, what are we doing and, and where have we checked the box and where there are needs and who's participating in different ways. I think it will also help both of our organizations to consider where we're investing resources that maybe we wanna consider diverting into these priorities, right? It may be that we have existing re resources going into other areas that aren't helping create this pathway. Um, so I think there were some great ideas that came from this conversation and I uh, just wanna thank the great staff work. And I, I, I know Sarah and I are really pleased uh, Sarah and I had the pleasure of interviewing for Sarai's role at hiring and bringing her on board. It's a joint shared position between our organizations. And again, I think it's representative of uh, the work that's happening in both organizations and the collaborative work that we're doing together. So we look forward to uh, what is a, a, tall a tall mountain that we have to climb together. Thank you, Steve. And I uh, also wanna thank you, Sarai. That was a really great presentation and uh, really paints a picture. And I think, you know, part of the journey that we're on together is, is building this partnership and system that I don't know if a lot of other places have done besides uh, Eugene and Lane County. One of the things that Steve asked us, was that Steve and I asked Sarai to do was to push us and to give her like free access to us, direct access to us to push us if she saw places in our organizations where we needed to move farther, faster. So there's a lot of things that are in this report and in this presentation that I think um, are, are doing that. And I really appreciate that. I even feel myself feeling uncomfortable sometimes with the numbers and I, and I know it's also the right numbers. I've shared with a number of you that I did participate in the point in time count this year because I have heard for years from people like it's an undercount, it's an undercount. So. This year I did it and um, I can tell you that it, it felt like that to me because I, I knocked on many car campers that wouldn't respond and so I couldn't count them. So I do, uh, as much as I really dislike the higher numbers, I feel like it's, it's pretty honest. Um, and I know we have a lot to do and I, I kind of share in Sarai's enthusiasm, like we're gonna figure this out. We have the right group of people, the right leadership and I'm just glad to be on the team at this time to make a difference. So thank you. Thank you. So I think that's a wrap, unless anyone has some uh, final final comments, but I think I want to appreciate again, as everyone has appreciate Sarai and your work and the clarity and the thoroughness of that um, discussion. And I think your the priorities are well established. We know where we need to go and thank you for laying that groundwork for us. And with that, I adjourn the council meeting and turn it over to Commissioner Buck. Thank you all very much. And we have adjourned the Board of County Commissioners meeting for this evening as well. Good night all.